Welcome back, everyone. A lot of our discussion so far in this section uh, has just been using things like the integral test to determine whether a series converges or diverges, but we haven't talked about finding what the series converges to or approximating uh, what the series converges to. Well, this next theorem is going to help us do just that. And so this theorem is called the remainder estimate theorem or the remainder estimate theorem for the integral test. And what it helps us do is create a lower bound and upper bound for the remainder of our series. So the way we actually approximate the sum of a series is just by using a partial sum that is adding up to some number of terms in our series. So in general, we'll denote a partial sum using S sub N, and this will be the sum of our series starting at I equals one and going up to N. And so this is gonna be like A1 plus A2 plus A3 up to and ending at A N. And so there's gonna be a lot more terms left over that are not included in this partial sum. And that is what we refer to as the remainder of our partial sum. And so you'll often see in the textbook and other resources that the remainder of our partial sum will be denoted by R sub N. And so that's what we're gonna do here. So S sub N, is like the sum of the first n terms of our series. And the error in our approximation using a partial sum of the first nth terms is just gonna be the sum of those remaining terms, what we call the remainder or r sub n. And that'll be the sum of the n plus first term, the n plus second term, the n plus third, and so on. All those other terms in our series that we ignored in our partial sum. And so technically, we actually really already proved this uh, remainder estimate theorem for the integral test in our earlier discussion and proof of the integral test. Let me go ahead and read this theorem to us now. So suppose the series that is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n is a convergent series. Maybe we could determine that it is convergent using the integral test. So it's a convergent series with positive terms. Suppose there exists a function f such that the three criteria for our integral test are met. That is, our function f is continuous, it is decreasing, and it gives us the terms in our series as we plug in the corresponding integers, like plugging in n equals 1 will give us a sub 1, plugging in n equals 2 will give us a sub 2, and so on for each and every term in our series. The textbook kind of states a little bit more to this theorem, but this is the really juicy part, the part that I think is most important. What the uh, integral test can be used to show is that the remainder of our series or the error in our approximation using the nth partial sum can be bounded by these two integrals. So we bound it up below with the integral from n plus one to infinity of our function f of x, and we bound it above by the integral from n to infinity of our function f of x dx. And what this remainder estimate is really useful for is if we do some kind of approximation using a partial sum, we'll know roughly how accurate our approximation is. It can also be used to determine how many uh, terms or what n value do we need to use in a partial sum to have a desired amount of accuracy. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and test our remainder estimate theorem out. And so in this example, we're gonna consider the series, it's a P series, the series that is the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n cubed. In the first part of this example, we're gonna calculate S sub 10, that is the partial sum of the first 10 terms. And then we're gonna use our remainder estimate theorem to estimate the error in this approximation. In part two, we're gonna determine the least value of n needed such that the partial sum of that number of terms will be accurate to three decimal places or to the nearest one one thousandth of the unit. So for the first part, we have to calculate S sub 10, which is gonna be the sum from n equals one to 10 of one over n cubed. So that'll be like one over one cubed plus one over two cubed plus one over three cubed and so on. And we'll go up to an end with one over 10 cubed. So this is just our 10th partial sum for this series, the sum of the first n terms. And we're gonna to wanna to use a calculator to help us evaluate the sum of these first 10 terms. All right, so when we use our calculators to take the sum of those first 10 terms, the calculator should tell us that uh, the 10th partial sum is gonna be approximately 1.19753. So to finish part one of our example, we also wanna estimate the error in this approximation. And that's where the remainder estimate theorem for our integral test is gonna come into play. 
And really we're just gonna be using kind of the right half of this inequality that says the remainder, which is the error in our approximation using the nth partial sum, right? The remainder is just the sum of those remaining terms, n plus one and so on. Well, the remainder is always gonna be less than the integral from n to infinity of our function that generates the term in our series. And so in this example, we don't really care what our error is bigger than, we just care more about what our error is less than. We want the upper bound for our error, that's what we're most often interested in. And we know, since we're using the uh, the 10th partial sum, the, uh, the remainder of the 10th partial sum, that is the sum of the 11th term, 12th term, and so on, is guaranteed to be less than the integral from 10 to infinity of our function one over x cubed. I rewrote one over x cubed as x to the power of negative three, just to make our integration maybe a little bit easier to do, because in order to use the power rule for antiderivatives, we have to have it written in the numerator, not in the denominator. So to find the antiderivative of x to the negative three, we have to increase the exponent by one, that gives us x to the negative two, and then divide by that new exponent. We still have to evaluate this antiderivative at our upper limit of integration, infinity, and subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration, which is 10. And so uh, when we plug in uh, infinity, or more properly, we should say that when we take the limit, as our input approaches infinity, we end up with infinity to the power of negative two, or one over infinity squared. That extra factor of negative two isn't gonna really contribute to anything, because when we have that factor of infinity in the denominator, and just a plain old constant in the numerator, that thing's gonna go to zero. So the first term from our antiderivative involving the infinity disappears or go to, goes to zero, and we have to subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at that lower limit of integration, and so we'll be subtracting away negative 10 to the negative two over two. So you have to be careful with those double negative signs here. And if we simplify this, we should get one over 200. And so now we know using this uh, partial sum approximation for our series, the partial sum of the first 10 terms or 1.19753 is gonna have an error of at most one over 200 or about 0 0.005. All right, so in part two of our example, we are now requiring that our error or r sub n is gonna be less than one one thousandth. So in order to ensure this happens, we need to make sure that our remainder or our error is less than one one thousandth. So we can set this inequality up and then solve this inequality for n. So in order to solve this inequality for n here, we're gonna first have to evaluate this improper integral in the middle of our inequality. And so that starts by finding the antiderivative of one over x cubed, but we found that in our previous example. We know that the antiderivative of one over x cubed or x to the negative three is negative x to the power of negative two divided by two. And so now if we evaluate this at the upper limit of integration or take the limit as x approaches infinity, that first term is gonna zero out or approach zero. And then we have to subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at our lower limit of integration, which is now our unknown n value. And so we're subtracting away negative n to the negative two over two. And I'm just gonna go ahead and simplify that a little bit, write it as negative one over two to the n squared. And so that simplifies to one over two times n squared. And this is the quantity that we need to now make less than one one thousandth, or in decimal form, 0 0.001. So now to finish this problem off, we just have to solve this inequality when is one over two n squared less than one over 1,000? So now to make progress towards solving this inequality, we have to clear the denominator. So we might start by multiplying both sides by 1,000. That'll give us 500 over n squared is less than one. And then to finish clearing the denominator, we can multiply both sides by n squared. And that gives us 500 is less than n squared. And now we can take the square root of each side and see that n must be bigger than the square root of 500. 
And now we can use our calculators to approximate the square root of 500, and the square root of 500 is about 22.36. So we need to choose the value of n that guarantees and make sure that we have this much accuracy. So we're never gonna round down when we're in a problem like this. We always have to round up to the next integer just to make sure that we have enough accuracy. Using only 22 terms in our partial sum approximation, will get us pretty close to the desired amount of accuracy, but it would not guarantee it in order to guarantee that we use an approximation that is accurate to the nearest one one thousandth we have to use 23 or more terms in our partial sum approximation. So the least value of n such that our partial sum approximation is gonna be accurate to one one thousandth is gonna to need to require n to be at least 23.